Welcome to Chief Evangelist. I'm your host, Ethan Butte. I'm on a mission to explore and understand the role of the Chief Evangelist and the movement behind it. How should CEOs be thinking about it? How does it benefit the company? Which companies and markets need evangelism most? What does the work involve? What does success look like? And who's a good fit as a Chief Evangelist? That's what we're exploring at chiefevangelist.com and in conversations like this one. Today, we're learning from a best-selling author, a speaker, and an investor. He's the host of the Marketer's Journey podcast. He's the president, co-founder, and CMO turned chief evangelist at Uberflip. Randy Frisch, welcome to Chief Evangelist. Thanks, Ethan. I am thrilled to be here. Both of us are ex-marketers. I almost got worried that you're going to get my intro wrong there because I, I even myself sometimes have to correct how I lead in to be like, I'm no longer a CMO. I am a chief evangelist. Yeah. And we're going to get into that. So uh, just so folks listening, uh, if they're listening for the first time, uh, which I assume a lot of people are, because this is the very first episode, we're going to get into the role. Then we'll move, definitely get into your story, which I know a little bit about, but I'm excited about kind of getting into uh, the move from CMO to chief evangelist. What were some of the pieces in play at the time? And then of course, we'll get into to the degree that people have asked you about the role, which I assume they have, um, you know, what have you been telling them? How should they be thinking about it and that kind of a thing? So certainly have very specific advice for others, but I'm going to start uh, with our, with where we like to start here, which is what is the most important job of a chief evangelist? That's a great question. I, I think a lot of people's mind debate between the obvious question, is it to promote your product or is it to promote your category? And I feel like we'll end up talking a lot about that. I debate that all the time. Uh, you know, and, and that was even before I was in a chief evangelist role. I mean, that was any time I was asked to speak at a big conference, uh, you know, jump onto a podcast. The question when I put together a deck is, how do I balance this element of thought leadership versus product advocacy? And the way I look at it at the end of the day is I can cast a wider net by thinking about the category, bringing people in through that category, and then highlight our customers as people who get to talk about why our product helps solve for that category. So, you know, it's impossible to, I believe, say you're responsible for one or another, but I think if you start ultimately about thinking about solving for a new problem as an evangelist and changing the way people approach their day to day, that is the opportunity to create disruption, to create a community that leans in. Um, you know, it's funny when, when I decided as you hit on to, take myself out of the CMO role, uh, which was an interesting decision in itself, uh, and, and take on this chief evangelist role. You know, some of the hardest people to explain this to was like my own family, right? Um, you know, my my dad, as an example, was like, wait, are you are you getting religious here? Like, what what is this evangelism thing? And, you know, we can all joke about that. But he was almost like a little bit just confused. And I, I so I did a lot of research. I did a lot of reading. I mean, you were one of the people I called if you if you remember just to say I like do. you know, tell me about how you've transitioned and and I think it's because in a way this is new, this idea of having a chief evangelist. It's not that new. New. We know Guy Kawasaki, you know, really uh, you know, helped propel Apple in ways by taking on that role and and helping Steve Jobs in so many ways advocate for you know the disruption that they were after. But you know, I I think in tech companies, in you know your average even public companies that have scaled, having this evangelism role is new. So we're all defining it in different ways. Um, and, and that's everything from what are the responsibilities, like you said, to how do we actually prove ROI? It was a whole other bag of, you know, fun. Yeah, and we'll have that fun. Uh, so, so this idea of promoting the problem or the category over the product itself, but trying to find that balance. And I think that divide that you drew there, and by the way, using customers as the best way to get into those stories, create community around it, and, and make it more about other people, other businesses, in order to draw attention to the problem and some of the solutions, which then typically leads into a product conversation at some point. That's the most fun thing, by the way, getting done with a presentation that's all in service of other people. And the most natural question afterward is like, 
is that what, is that what you guys do at Uber Flip? You know, like talk right. to me about how that's structured, you know, that kind of a thing. Same thing with for for me here at Bomb Bomb. But um that tension you got at between how do we balance problem versus product or category versus product is the same tension of, you know, what's the ROI of this role. But to to stay really practical, um, you know, talk a little bit about the role from a uh activity or function standpoint, like in a good day or a good week or a good month or a good quarter, what are some of the things that you're doing and what are some of the things that are happening, like just in a really functional way? Yeah, absolutely. So bef before I get there, I, I, I think it's really important to outline for anyone who's thinking about taking on this role or thinks they could be great at it. You probably should already be doing chief evangelism before you have the title. And that was without a doubt the reality for me. The challenge I had was maybe I got to do 15 to 20% of my week on this stuff, right? And, and the challenge, I say, in getting there was everything else that I had commitments towards. As CMO, I had a team reporting into me. I had to work also with you know, my other peers on the senior leadership team in terms of sales leadership and customer success. So the ability to balance all that and then get to the items that we'll talk about in a moment, it's really tough. Um, but you have to have a desire to try and squeeze it in. And so if, if you're sitting here being like, you know, I'm tired of everything I'm doing. I just want to do something new. I'm going to be a chief evangelist. I think that's going to be a really tough jump because I'll be very honest, jumping to where I am today and the stuff that I do that I will unpack for you, you know, all this tease, uh, sometimes I struggle to fill a hundred percent, right. It, it, and, and that's me just being very honest because, you know, you almost have to take a step back and be willing to brainstorm a little bit more with yourself and come up with that next big idea and not have something that you're putting out to the team quite yet because you're working in the background on it. Um, and, and as a result, like that was tough for me because I went from a, a guy who like, you know, probably did 140% of, of a typical job just in terms of the hours and the commitment and, you know, the balance and the sacrifice on family, uh, you know, that was needed to, you know, my wife can watch now, especially in a work from home environment where sometimes I'm like, all right, I, I need to figure out my next project. I need to figure out how I'm going to ring the bell for our category, for our product. I got to figure out what's next. Now, what, what do I do though? Um, you know, on a, on a daily basis. So as I said, I, I think a big part of this is creating a narrative that people can buy into, uh, you know, your community, your customers. Um, again, I, I put community first because sometimes your community is people who are not a customer yet or may never be, but they can help advocate on your behalf. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of these just to, to bring some light. So one, you know, I mean, we're doing this right now. We're podcasting. I've also been podcasting. I think I've done around... Just just under 400 episodes of podcasts, and you know, I did I did a series of podcasts um, before my current show, which has had about 120 episodes. That's called the Marketer's Journey, and that is a great example of where I get to bring together a community. In in that case, every week I chat with the CMO, um, and that CMO is my opportunity to hear their perspective. Um, without getting into the weeds of the show, there's a big element of it that is talking about the buyer journey. And the way I do that is I weave in what we do at Uberflip and what our category is, which we haven't really hit on yet, which is content experience. Now, for those who are trying to figure out, well, what does that term even mean? Let's park that for now, all right? Because this yeah. is more about evangelism and I'm not going there, but it's about how content gets used at a high level inside of your go-to-market. So by talking to them about their buyer journey and then asking them these questions and getting them to talk about the realities that may be broken or need to be fixed, it's my ability to elevate it. And to be honest, like I get to elevate it with CMOs who are beyond the level that I ever got to in my own career. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, people who have worked at Salesforce, Okta, uh, you know, really cool B2C brands like StockX. I'm a shoe guy. So that was cool for me. Uh, you know, so I, I get to chat with all these people and that's one way that I get to do this on a weekly basis and bring this narrative to the whole world. Now, another example that again is not our customer base, 
uh, that I did very recently. And yeah, I'm going to somewhat timestamp this uh, podcast by saying so, but I feel like we've got a rocky year ahead of us. So this will last. Uh, you know, we're, we're living in really uncertain economic times. Um, and I went to, to write a blog post, uh, <clears throat> it was probably a couple of months ago, on how to navigate marketing as a CMO during a marketing downturn, right? And I started typing this thing out. And honestly, you know, two paragraphs in, I was like, I don't think I actually know anything about this, right? Like, you know, if, if I looked back to, you know, my marketing leadership experience, and I looked to when the last real economic downturn was, which is, you know, 2008, I wasn't at that CMO level yet in my career. So I looked back and I said, you know what, instead of me getting up there and trying to evangelize, if you will, what to do in, the, in these situations, I went out and I interviewed five amazing CMOs who were actually at the CMO level back in 2008, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Brian Cardin, who you probably know, uh, Alyssa Fink, who's on my board, who was at Tableau at the time. I mean, these are really experienced CMOs who have been through that. Peter Isaacson added a ton of, gr of great perspective. He was at Adobe at the time. And, and by using their voice and using the platforms that I have, whether it's LinkedIn or different followers, you know, different, you know, avenues, using that and using their voice, I'm able to amplify the bigger issues, right? I'm able to get their perspective on the challenges that relate to our customer base, but even more so the category that we're within. So, you know, to answer your question in a much more concise way, I think a big part of what I take on is how do I bring the voices of others using the reach that I've been able to establish? Love it. And so there's this, um, I, what I want, where I want to go next is kind of like the inside out, outside in part. So I love this idea that um, you indirectly said, which is, you know, the chief evangelist isn't the genius who generates all of these things. You just have the space, the time, the perspective, the depth of knowledge of the market, the depth of knowledge of the product, the depth of knowledge of the customer to find these various things and put them together in relevant and useful ways in order to kind of create community and have this kind of ongoing conversation. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, as, as you say that, it reminds me that another thing that I like to do in general and, and, and serves me well in this role is I, I like to create frameworks. Um, and, you know, my, my co-founder sometimes kids that I create way too many of them. Uh, he's probably right. Uh, but, but I think it establishes a way for everyone to buy in. And I think some of the most famous, simple frameworks out there are very simple, right? And they're supposed to be simple because that way anyone can attach them. And sometimes you're not even so much learning anything new, rather you have a simple way to think about things. You know, one that I talk through all the time that's not my own is people process technology, right? That triangle of sorting through how you, you know, how you establish, you know, your team and, and how you succeed. Um, same thing is what I've done in the space that we compete in, which is content experience. You know, I've got different frameworks for everything from a go-to-market strategy to outlining the details of content experience uh, execution. And once I have those frameworks, I can talk about the framework, but I can get our customers to get up and talk about how they're executing using that framework. And the beauty is once you do that, all your case studies are both unique and the same, right? They're, they're unique because everyone's got a different strategy in a slight way or a different execution or a different target market that, that they're going after, but they tell the story in the same way. Right. And it's able to fit in the pieces. And then as a result, even these customers, when they speak to each other, they can relate by saying, well, how are you doing this part of the framework? Right. Um, when, a, when a new customer is coming on board with us and we're teaching them this framework, they have 20 video examples they can see of customers who have told these little mini stories. So that's a big way in which I've been able to take this and scale it both, as I said, outside of the business, but in this case, inside the business, where we start almost talking more about our product, but at a more holistic view of execution. 
Let's go inside. So you have all of this customer contact. You're developing a lot of the frameworks that are being used probably by uh, customers as well as employees, um, or at least I assume the, this is helpful for onboarding employees, for example, having these frameworks and these histories and these case studies. Talk about your relationship inside uh, in terms of what you're learning with all of this external contact with your ideal buyers. Sure. Um, so. So insight is a careful balance. Uh, and that was something that, you know, going back to my decision to no longer be the CMO was also something that I, I really needed to drop that title. I, you know, I had tried to be very honest. I had tried before to kind of be the CMO and have a, a really strong number two who was asked to operate as number one at the VP of marketing level. Um, and he was, this person was still reporting into me they had a lot of autonomy, but not full autonomy because I was still kind of this internal voice of what are we going to do next? So making that jump was my um, commitment to also distance myself from the day-to-day -day decisions. Um, so in many ways, I would say that our marketing team now operates completely separate from me. Now, in fact, one of the things that we did was we shifted that that our new marketing leader would report into my co-founder who's CEO instead of into me. Um, wouldn't make sense for a CMO or VP of marketing to report into a chief evangelist, even though I'm also president, but you know, that, that, that title's way too formal for me. Um, so, so that, that was a big, you know, rule that I established for myself at the same time. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't interact with those teams. Uh, and that's where I have to make myself more of a resource to them and, and, you know, offer thoughts and opinions at the right time, but let them go and interpret that and execute it in the way they want. So I would say within the marketing organization, to answer your question, you know, some of the people I, I spend the most time with are probably more on the product marketing and content marketing side of the equation. Um, you know, naturally content experience too with what we do. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, a lot of it, you know, when we talked just a moment ago about frameworks is how do we leverage those frameworks in terms of how we talk through our product? How does it weave into our sales pitches? Um, our pitch deck probably has 70% of the slides that I at one point used in a keynote over the years, right? I mean, they've just, you know, the best of those slides, you know, kind of become our sales pitch, uh, you know, Adjusted, obviously, for for sales pitch versus uh, you know the entertainment value of, of a keynote, but uh, you know little subtleties of arming the team with those abilities. There's another area of the business though that I, I get to spend a lot of time with too, and that's on the revenue side. Um, and the the idea there is that my team can bring me in for perspective either to a prospect who's trying to understand the space and where this fits in, or, uh, you know, to an existing customer who, you know, just needs perspective or trying to challenge their team. So one of the things that we started to leverage in our organization, and I got really involved with, which has been really cool is, so first to set some context, we we typically sell to larger enterprises, uh, mid-market to enterprise, but we have a lot of big enterprise cus customers. And we've started to roll out what we call uh, forum days. And forum days are where we take an account that has you know, a large install base of users with us, uh, but also a lot of expansion opportunity. And we will run, because it's virtual often these days, we'll run a multi-day event, you know, where it's like, you know, Altogether, it's about a, half, a full day uh, over over two to three days, and we gather, you know, on a Zoom like experience. And I end up being more of the MC of this event. Um, now, when I say MC, I'll I'll lead with a little bit of thought leadership, but just like I said at the beginning, I'll bring in some of our customers, not just the ones who are presenting to this forum. So, say we were presenting to you know Apple, right? I'm not just going to have Apple speak. I'm going to have other companies come and stand up and say, here's how we're doing this. And they'll walk through these frameworks that I, that I described and their approach and their execution. So it ends up almost being this form of learning from each other with each other. And my involvement there again is really just to bring different voices to the table. 
Um, you know, it's not to get up and say, here's how to use our product. It's to get others to talk about how they're using our, our product. So at the end of the day, I, I very much get brought in across, as we said, marketing and any go-to-market strategy within the organization. Love it. I mean, what you were talking about there with the forum days, is it forum days, uh, mm -hmm. was um, really the essence of community. This idea that you facilitated it, you created the opportunity, you created the space, but it's just as much about kind of peer-to-peer -peer connections who are united through the common problem that Uberflip kind of brought them in together on. Um, I also really like this idea of getting involved with accounts. I do the same thing and mine is a little bit less formal. Sometimes it is, uh, and I'm going to turn this around as a question. I'm going to offer my experience to tell no, me. You do this related. great. I know you do it. I, I, yeah. I, I admire your approach. Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, mine is a little bit ad hoc. I periodically make myself available and it's part subject matter expert. Sometimes it's just executive presence and sometimes it's just, you know, executive to executive within that account. Um, and our CSM doesn't want to be in that conversation. They just want to facilitate it. Other times I'm in um, a very small group setting with, a, with an AE or with a CSM, depending on whether it's a prospect or a customer. Um, but the two kind of key ideas there are our internal subject matter expert, because like you, I've been involved in this idea and movement. For us, it's kind of video messaging, you know, relationships through video, some of these themes for you, it's content experience, but certainly you're one of the world's foremost experts on content experience. And so you're brought in for your expertise, probably also though, as co-founder and a, you know, a C-level uh, operator for, you know, your entire time with Uberflip. Um, how, how do you think about that? Like what typically when you get brought into that, um, what are some of the key themes that either, um, your team member wants you there for, or that the customer really values? So it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think the first thing that I often try and do is avoid talking about the product first, because, um, I have a, I wear a lot of hats, right? And and not every chief evangelist will necessarily even have the passion that they, that I have in our case for our solution. I mean, as a co-founder, I am obviously drinking the Kool Aid, you know, in an in an overboard manner. You've been so stirring it. it. You've been pouring it. Yeah. Exactly. I, I I have over added the powder. Um, so I, I have to be careful not maybe more so than the average evangelist, in my opinion, not to come in and seem biased, right? And and so I, right or wrong, don't know if it's right, I make an effort to really focus on the problem and talk in, you know, using a lot of metaphors and analogies to, to look at like, what is wrong with our approach today when we look around and we see the other ways that we do different things? Uh, it could be in business or it could be in our consumer lives. And I find that by, by becoming more relatable in that fashion, um, my goal is to be trusted at the end of the day, right? And, and I think that's, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever said it this way, but I, I think that's actually maybe one of the most important elements of, of someone in this role is the ability to, to be trusted, uh, you know, to be able to, you know, say what you're going to say and the person not be like, oh, they're just trying to sell me something, right? Yeah. Uh, and as a result, that's where sometimes you got to, you got to admit when you don't know, or you got to admit that there's other perspectives. Um, you know, I, I gave you the example before of writing this post about marketing in a downturn and going and getting other people who actually knew what the hell they were talking about. I mean, that was, that was this moment for me of realizing, shit, like I'm, I'm maybe not the right guy here, but that's actually hopefully going to allow people to trust me when I do think I have the answer. Um, and when I don't, the beauty again is bring other people's perspectives in and elevate their voices and add legitimacy and truth for, through them. So I, I think that's maybe, you know, I, again, I've, I've never really thought about that element of, you know, people being able to trust you and being truthful, but maybe that really is the key to this role. Yeah. The humility piece is a really important, I mean, trust is the key word, uh, but the humility that I heard in your willingness and ability to say, I don't know, and your willingness and ability to turn the spotlight to other people and, or go to other people uh, in order to fill in the gaps and to, 
and to express that in the presence with other people, even as you come in as the expert and the authority on the topic, which absolutely you are. But I think that ability to, to um, disarm some of the, you know, standard buyer posture when they come into an environment that, that feels perhaps like a potential sales environment. And I think that is, I, I think as we have more and more of these conversations, um, I think that's going to continue to emerge is that, um, you know, when I interviewed Guy Kawasaki on some of these themes, he called it the purest form of sales. And it was this selling without selling idea. It's like the reason you want to buy is because I've equipped you, I've, I've informed you, I've helped you without any of the standard threats. And so for you, I don't know about you, tell me a little bit about your personality type. I mean, you already cast forward to, um, you know, uh, some of the skills or some of the ways people should be thinking about the role. But for me, um, I know that I, like you, I'm deep in, I was doing work with our two co-founders for two years before I joined the company. I've been at the company for over 11 years now. I've written two and a half books on the topic. I'll take any stage and any opportunity to share these ideas and even just to openly discuss them in a group setting. Like I have, um, also over poured the powder, uh, and over drunk the Kool-Aid, uh, over the years. And, um, but I'm also not the guy that wants to get into the weeds on, um, pricing, packaging, to, like, I don't want to sell. That's why I'm not a salesperson. Um, I'm much more comfortable getting people excited about it and handing it over, knowing full well that someone's going to get a commission on something that I, you know, took from 40% sold to 90% sold. They need to close the gap, but I'm willing to give away the entire commission just to get that gap closed by somebody else. Like, how, how do you think about selling? Like, I, I think you've already, I'm sure you're, uh, helping rather than selling. I think you're equipping and informing rather than persuading or um, I don't know, any of these other words we so, might use to kind of drive someone where they might not go naturally. Um, so it's funny. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I've ever thought about it the way you're, you're framing it, but you're, as you're just describing this, you're taking me back to like when I was in university and, and in university, I was the guy that and, and you can all remember university, especially if you did business school. Uh, we all broke out into these groups to take on a project, you know, especially if you're in marketing classes or all these, you know, projects with, you know, some sort of long paper. And then you did a presentation in front of the class. Everyone wanted me in their group purely because I did the best presentations. Yeah, you know, like my PowerPoint, and this is back in the day where like PowerPoint had much more limited animation capabilities, yeah, but I almost yeah. made the PowerPoint stuff look like Flash. Right. Like I just, yeah. I pushed the limits on it before, you know, it was designed what it to do, what it can do and other tools can do better today. Um, and, you know, for me, it's not that I didn't value the paper, right? The paper probably ended up being 70% of the grade and the presentation was 30% of the grade. But I knew that the most value I could add was getting someone to get excited about why to read that paper right? Why this was something that was a challenge that you wanted to lean into and you wanted to understand better. And I think of it the same way today um, and maybe similar to what you were saying. I don't necessarily want to get in seven, involved in that at last 70% of the, of the negotiation. Um, although I do think marketing is involved there at every stage. Uh, that's a whole other discussion, but um, in different ways uh, than, than the negotiating perhaps. But, but I want I want to get up and get someone excited about something. And that's that's the part that I feel, you know, really resonates with me being a storyteller. Um, you know, like you, I, I also took on writing a book in the last number of years. And uh, honestly, it shocked me that, that number one, that I would actually do it and that I'd actually enjoy it. Um, and that, you know, maybe the biggest shock is how well it's landed. Um, because if, if I think back, I just, I didn't think that that would be the type of project that I would enjoy to take on. But at the end of the day, I realized this is just storytelling. This is getting someone excited. You know, I, I wasn't going to write a thousand page book where I get into the weeds of execution. This is more of a challenger mindset. You know, think about how you're doing things and is there a better way? And it ends up being something that allows me to lead with like, if you want to hear more from me, this is, this is my overall mindset. Right. And, and I think that, you know, back to your question, which is what is my personality? My personality is a storyteller. Um, I like to get up and I like, I like to get people excited. Um, but getting people excited is really just the beginning. Right. Um, 
if you look, and, and I remember one time our, uh, our VP of sales got up in front of the company and he wanted to demonstrate how complex the buyer journey was, right? So just before him, the, you know, uh, one of our marketing leaders got up and kind of showed this multi-touch attribution mindset of a sales, you know, of, of the marketing side. And it showed that there was like 30 touch points, which seems like a ton of touch points. Then the sales, and, and they coordinated this presentation. The sales leader gets up, he shows his slides, and he shows 327 different touch points, right? These are emails, calls, text messages, and this is just one deal, right? And he was basically trying to show the life of that deal. Like you said, Ethan, like, that's maybe not my forte. It's not getting into the 327. And it's maybe not even the full 30 on the marketing side, but it's getting someone excited to want to go through those 357, if I did my math properly, combining the two. Or, you know, finding ways as well to get them so excited at the beginning that you can reduce that from 357 to something less, you know, because you create that narrative that they can buy into and that they can point others to. So, you know, very often, you know, one of the things I find in this role is when it, when I'm able to be, when, when a member of my team brings me in, it's not, here's Randy, and then you're never going to see him again. If I create a good connection, then for either from an exec alignment perspective, as you said, or sometimes just other members of the team, they'll come back to me and ask me to, you know what, can you present this again to this other group, right? And that to me is great. It just means that, you know, the first group's bought in, we need to, you know, we need to revisit this for that next group and that's in that journey. Love it. This this idea of um, getting people excited through storytelling, let's just use that as the big thing you've talked about social, you've talked about stage presentations, you've talked about virtual presentations, you've talked about a book, you've talked about podcasting. So there are all these channels to tell stories and create excitement, also to share your point of view. I mean, you also uh, talked about, you know, these are the problems with the way we're approaching things, right? And for you, that's around content marketing, but I think that's that's also fundamental to the role. Um we all know that that excitement is critical. We all know like trust, it accelerates things. Things go faster when people are excited and bought in, they see your point of view, et cetera. Um, where I'm going with this kind of <laughs> in a roundabout way is kind of like, how do we know that we're successful? Like, how do you know that you're successful? And I guess I'll also bridge this into, um, you've also done a good job of talking about how, in a way, how you landed in this role. But, you know, when it comes to working with your co-founder or your board, you know, what are they looking for? What are you personally looking for? How much are you quantifying the ability to excite people through storytelling? Like, it's it's hard. We all know it's critical to the sale, um, but it's one of those things that's difficult to capture and measure. Yeah. So, so I think it, that work sometimes gets discounted or it just seems like a fun thing to do or like, you know, all the, all the criticisms so, people have of marketing is like, you know, the arts and crafts <laughs> department or whatever kind of like things people want to throw at it. Um, but it's all necessary to, for the whole thing to work, but it's hard to yeah. capture. How, how are you working about, on that, thinking about it for yourself? So, and so for first, a, a funny story to answer you is, you know, when, when we decided we were going to make this change, this was something me and my co-founder discussed uh, we've worked together for over 10 years now, so we know each other well. You know, we presented it to the board. They were very much on side. They they thought it was the right time to make this move for, for a number of reasons I won't go into right now. But, you know, so they were bought in. But then naturally, like any investment, about 90 days later, one quarter later, next board meeting, they're like, Randy, can you present the ROI of your new role at the board meeting, right? And I'm like, shit, like what, what am I going to present? So actually I reached out to uh, Dan Steinman over at, at Gainsight, who's another person who's had this title. Uh, Gainsight's an amazing company, as many of us know, who, you know, built a huge following and huge community. And Dan was a big part of that. And, you know, he gave me just a couple of very basic tips about thinking about ROI. So I, I'm going to share them not as my own ideas yet again here, but, you know, sharing evangelism from another evangelist. Yeah. Um, and, and he said a couple of things. He said, you know, in his case, his CEO knew the value he was bringing. And, and I think that's an important element here is it's going to be hard sometimes to show that ROI. If you're in this role, you need buy-in from whoever is 
you know, whether it's the board, whether it's the CEO who's, you know, brought you into this, they they need to know the value you can bring and that you do bring, even if you can't show it every single day, right? So that's, that was point number one. You know, the other thing he said is, it's going to be hard to show some of these items on a attribution dashboard or on a typical ROI calculator. And he said to me, he goes, it's almost on you to highlight the ROI, right? You need to find ways, whether it's in your Slack message, whether it's in your, uh, you know, email updates to the company, however you communicate, talk about what you're doing, you know, not in a braggy way, in still a humble way, but get up in front and make sure people know the things that are going on. Because if you just do them in isolation and you do them not always tied to the brand, some people won't know. Um, so, you know, and, and that's a hard one for me, to be honest, because I, I hate, especially as a co-founder, I think it's more about me to elevate those people around me in the company. Um, but, you know, there's people in your, in your company who will buy into your role and, and, you know, kindly asking them to post when you get a win, right? You know, I talked about this podcast I do. It's a great uh, pipeline generator. And, uh, you know, I didn't even have to ask for this, but a couple of weeks ago, one of our, our top reps uh, you know, posted about how amazing the ROI is on this and how qualified the people he gets to speak to are through the connections, through, you know, the discussions that are happening on this podcast. You know, getting those things to be quoted is re are, are really important to being able to justify this role at the end of the day. Yeah. What advice would you have? I mean, and we don't need to get into how your board thought about it or even how you pitched it to your board, but, you know, for someone listening, let's just say a leader inside an organization who's thinking like, is this something we should be doing? It seems like we're kind of doing this ad hoc between these two or three team members. Yeah. Uh, again, something I learned from Dan, uh, you're probably already evangelizing. You're just not doing it in a coordinated or intentional way. Um, so for anyone that's listening to a conversation like this, that's thinking like, should we be doing this? Like, what are the market conditions? What um, what characteristics of the company? Um, fr from an organizational perspective, what would you advise someone that's like, hey, that's a really interesting thing you've done, Randy. Like, should we be thinking about that? Or how should we be thinking about that? So interesting true story is before I pitch this to anyone, I took the approach to pitch it to myself, right? Uh, and I know that sounds super cheesy, uh, and I am usually not like this, but this was going to be a big change for me. And, and you know, I'd argue anyone who's going to take a career shift to a title like this, it, there's not an obvious next step after this, you know, so let's not go there today. Um, so I, I was like, am I, am I taking a step back? What am I doing? I was the CMO. I was very proud of that. It was, a, it was also a very natural way, given that Uberflip is a MarTech solution, um, that is content experience, you know, is, is the basis of what we do. It's such a great way, even in that, to connect with our community. So I, I, the way I pitched myself is I built a deck as though I was presenting to myself. And at this point, I wasn't even thinking about the board. I wasn't thinking about showing this to my co-founder. I wasn't thinking about anything other than, can I build a deck to show to myself that's gonna get me, first of all, excited about this, feel like I can add value. But the last part, and this was the, this was the hardest part, was set the rules of engagement. And that was what the, 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 the titles of the slide was, it was rules of engagement. And it was rules for myself in terms of what this would mean, how I would act as a, you know, contributor, but also detach myself from marketing, you know, what reporting structures would be like, um, all these different elements. And within there, there were some really hard decisions I had to make in terms of shifting the definition of my role, you know, you know, both within marketing and within the company as a whole. So I, I would say that the first thing is, is you've got to convince yourself that this, this is right. And, and it, and, and to be clear, this wasn't a one day exercise for me. This was something I did. I sat on for a few weeks. I looked back on it. I tweaked it. I had some conversations like, you know, uh, you know, Sangram was another great, great uh, chief evangelist I spoke to. I ran the deck by him. He was the first person that I shared this with and got his perspective. This was like, sell myself that this is the right move. Once I did that, then it was the next step of 
going to my co-founder in this case. If if you're thinking about this move for yourself and listening to this podcast, that may not be your co-founder. I mean, this, you don't have to be a founder to become a chief evangelist. Uh, you know, it could be the CEO in your organization. It could be your current boss. Um, you know, but bring it to them once you've already, once you're already sold. Once you've already had to kind of fight through those objections. And at that point, you figure out what is that path to get there. Um, now, some people are probably sitting here being like, well, I'm, I want to be chief evangelist, not for my current company. I want to go to this other company. I think that's a much harder move. Uh, and, and I think that as much as you may want that, you don't know what that company is and you don't know how committed you're going to be to that solution until you've been involved in some part of the go-to-market for that business. So I personally think that it's a lot easier to jump into this role when you already know the customer base you know the frameworks, you know the storyline, and you're so sold on it that you're ready to pull others in. Totally. And for so many different, I agree with you completely. I, I think any leader thinking about, should we formalize this function? It feels like perhaps we should. Uh, I would look internally first and foremost. I, I would think it would be difficult to impossible to walk into an organization. And that's one of the reasons I regard it as a career risk for myself to go from VP marketing to chief evangelist, which, you know, worked out between Steve and me. It wasn't, I, I didn't have to sell my, in fact, he was kind of selling it to me. Steve's really good at selling things. Um, <laughs> he's like, I think we need an evangelist. I think you're the guy for it. And and it made sense. And, and I did it despite the risk, knowing that I can't just, you know, whenever my time at BombBomb Bomb is over, I'm not just going to walk into another organization as a chief evangelist for all of these reasons. But for, I want to highlight one in particular that you mentioned earlier, which is this high trust environment. This, you know, it obviously takes a visionary set of leaders. In your case, you're a co-founder, so that's a little bit off to the side here, a, a foregone conclusion um, with regard to this position. But like it takes a CEO who believes that this is important, who is has enough faith and trust and confidence in you and the work that you've done and the perspective you have and your ability to turn real results even when I can't always see them or understand them or put them up on a slide in a clear manner. And you don't have that trust coming in. You don't have the trust from the AEs or the CSMs. We talked a little bit about that. You don't have the trust from the community. Like the customers are like, I was onboarded by this person. I see these people on social media. This is the person who uh, gave the best presentation at their user conference or whatever the case. Like, who is this new person? Like, I, I just can't see a new person walking into a new organization, even in maybe the same market. But that's all theoretical. Um couple really, uh, A, does that trigger anything for you? I mean, the, the only thing I would add to that, that that we've hit on already is even more so as we talk about someone new coming in, if you've been there in another role and you've already added value, people will not question at the beginning when you struggle to show that ROI on a piece of paper because they know that you're committed to the organization. They know that you've gone on and rescued an account or brought brought a deal over the line. They know how committed you are. This becomes that element of being able to do that without the need to always have a dashboard to back it up. Now, I'm not suggesting dashboards are not important and a lot of roles need them, but I'm yet to figure out what the dashboard for this one looks like other than activity-based. Yeah, which we all know isn't results. It's just activity. No. Although although like excitement, it's a it's a great precursor to actually achieving results. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, you, you need, I mean, listen, like we said before, you need activity, right? And and sometimes it, it will get hard. Um, I referenced this that, you know, I've had some weeks where like I don't get to 100% and that kills me. Um, but sometimes I find later that that actually allowed me to give some some time to think. And one of the projects I just wrapped up, which is really cool, um, I won't get into it here, but it, it, it was basically taking something that's been on our product roadmap and doing it in a, I'm not even going to call it an MVP, more of a proof of concept um, that I built on top of Airtable. Um, and, and it was my ability to detach myself, think about our product, think about where it needs to go. And it's been a fun side project that is now morphed ironically as i you know talk about this and kind of realize it it's morphed into a new keynote it's morphed into something we're using as a webinar on our marketing team it's a new framework that we're going to be using so you know if i didn't have that downtime i maybe wouldn't have picked up this project which led to something great next project i do could lead to absolute nowhere but you know the the idea is 
you know, you have the opportunity to experiment in this role and you need to embrace that. Yeah. And I, and I would then cast this back out to, to a leader who's thinking about it or someone who's thinking about the position. I've, I've, I've had my position described as a luxury before. I don't know if you've encountered that yet, but it's this, it, but, but what you just said there, especially in a creative role, um, you are at some level developing and advancing the point of view. And you already mentioned some of your work winds back up in sales decks, like, you know, you're setting this tone for a variety of different things. And so this ability to allow, um, seemingly disparate experiences and projects and activities, to all work together with all the things that are already inside you around this movement and the stories that you've collected and told in your own experiences to turn into new things like that does require some space and time and confidence and trust. And it's, it's a little bit of a leap of faith, but um, I, I think we'd both agree it's worth it. Um, just as, as we wind down here in general, what, what thoughts do you have about the future of the role? I assume when you took it on, all the people that you've known throughout your career, the relationships that you've built, you've been talking about this a little bit and getting some of the feedback. I'm sure you have some of your own thoughts or you have some when you made the commitment to go chief evangelist in particular. Like, what are your thoughts on the future of this role? It's a great question. Uh, so so I, I think we'll see more of this role in organizations. I, I think that many people probably have someone already in this role. They just don't have the title. Uh, and, I, you know, I think what the title allows you to do is get from someone who maybe does this on the side with 20% of their time, as I said, to someone who's committed to it and seeing what that can do. Um, you know, the... I'll caution maybe a, a little bit with this role in terms of longer term, because I've, I've thought about that for my career. And this is, you know, this is the no BS, like, you know, here's my concerns. The one challenge with it is it can be very isolating, right? In in not the way you'd expect, because you're, you're actually interacting with a ton of people, right? I mean, the amount of customers I talk to, the amount of analysts that I still engage with, you know, being out at events and talking in front of amazing large audiences, but you don't necessarily have your own direct team, right? And, and I think that is the one isolating part, right? I went in the organization from having, I think at one point, six or seven senior direct reports to now I have zero, right? And that's a huge shift for me. Uh, and that doesn't matter if you're a you know, founder, uh, CMO, uh, you, know, you could be a COO. I know other people who are COOs who have moved into this role or chief customer officers who have moved into this role. You know, in many of those cases, you have, you have a team and, and that element of leadership is important. So what I'm not sure is how long I can do this. You know, I don't think this, you know, I'm not doing this as a one-year tour of duty, but I don't know if I can do this for 10 years. Right, I, I think at some point I'm going to miss that team interaction and having a direct team that that I plan with and I strategize with. Um, you know, I still get to do that a little bit, as I mentioned. You know, working closely with our product marketing leader or whoever it might be. But at some point, that's the part I think you got to think about: is when will you need that? Um, and if you can't commit to experiencing this for, for a prolonged amount of time, don't even bother jumping into the role. Be the person who does it for 20% of your time because there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, in fact, the more people in our organization who want to act like an evangelist, the better I think I'm doing and the better our company is doing. So there's two ways to do this. There's one where you are the chief evangelist and then there's another where you are an evangelist within the organization and you have another role. So I think you got to figure out which one's right for you. So good. And uh, I, gosh, I guess we'll call it there. I, we're, I, I was thinking about this podcast, which we're just getting going. And I'm like, I think I'm going to need to have, I just looked at the agenda I put together. I, was like, I think I'm going to have each guest like at least a couple of times. I've got like 10 more questions minimum, <laughs> but for the sake of time and, and to just, it's this is fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, last fun question for you. What is something besides content experience? What's something that you naturally evangelize in your own life? Just because you love it. I mean, you mentioned shoes, but you don't have to go there. Uh, you know, I, I, I do the shoes just to be cool to my own son because uh, he's into it. So I, I think that, that's got a different motive. Um, you know what? I, I, think, I think it's technology in general. Uh, I'm the type of person who's going to buy the, the newest gadget. You know, you think of, of, you know, crossing the chasm. I am that true early adopter, innovator, 
um, in terms of all the purchases in my house. Uh, so for a long time, I, I was a big evangelist for like Peloton products before everyone had a Peloton product. Uh, yeah. Now I feel like they have enough of a following. I don't have to do that anymore. But but I like to try. My things. work is done here. <laughs> I like to try things early. I'd say that's that's the big thing for me. And then I like to, you know, use that as an opportunity to give my perspective. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to sell someone on it. I'm going to tell them what I like about it and what I don't like about it. Love it. Uh, for folks who enjoyed this as I did, Randy, first, thank you so much. Um, but for people who really enjoyed this, they want, want to learn more about you. They want to learn more about your podcast, your book, Uberflip, the work that you do, uh, maybe to the degree that you're sharing some of the products you're pioneering as an early adopter. Where would you send people to follow up and learn more about you and connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a number of places people could go. You want to grab my book. Uh, it's called Fuck Content Marketing. So you, you can tell the type of marketing I do. It's available on Amazon. Uh, the best place though, just to follow along with things that I post, probably LinkedIn. Uh, you can follow me there, connect with me there and uh, look forward to you know making you part of my community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Randy Frisch. Uh, and thank you for listening to this conversation on Chief Evangelist. If you enjoyed it, if you learned something, if it made you think a little bit differently today, share it with someone else. Evangelize the podcast. My name is Ethan Butte with feedback, questions, anything else. You can also hit me up on LinkedIn. Again, Ethan Butte, E-T-H-A-N-B-E-U-T-E. -E -E. Randy Frisch, you're awesome. I appreciate your time and I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. That wraps up this episode of Chief Evangelist. Thank you for joining us and thanks to Ringmaster Conversational Marketing for helping bring these episodes to you. With any thoughts or questions about the Chief Evangelist role, message me on LinkedIn. I'm Ethan Butte, E-T-H-A-N-B-E-U-T-E. -E -E. For show notes and more of these conversations, visit chiefevangelist.com.